Welcome back to Inside Games, the only channel brave enough to remind you that Sony is a company. I mean, come on, hold on, Bruce. No, Sony's my close personal friend. Uh, Jack, Daxter, and me, we've all, we've all had one too many beers and smooched a little bit, uh, and it was a great time, and we're all best friends. You wouldn't understand. That is very brave of you to admit. Uh, and if that is the case, apparently your mouth kiss friends bury you in a bunch of annoying paperwork, ignore you for months, and uh, hide you behind more popular, richer friends. Jack and Dexter wouldn't do that to me, would they? I don't know them personally, okay? But a lot of indie devs are saying that they've been done like that, and it really does not sound great. Yeah, this, this is kind of interesting, because everyone's doing the, like, we don't want to burn bridges dance, everybody's kind of talking around the thing, but uh, it's, it's pretty clear who's being discussed here, and it amounts to Sony basically not giving a shit when it comes to smaller scale and indie developers. The mass callout started with indie games publisher Neon Doctrine co-founder Ian Garner, who was, quote, mad enough to burn some bridges <laughs> and vented about all their frustrations with, quote, Platform X who is, quote, the operator of a very successful console and does not have Games Pass. So yeah, I mean, that could refer to a number of other companies, but consensus from other indie devs who explicitly name PlayStation make it pretty clear Sony is the one in the crosshairs here. However, we will respect Garner's intention and merely report the statements as made, referring to Platform X. And for a brief splash of context, Garner's Neon Doctrine has published several indie titles, including Simulacra and La Grand Legacy Tale of the Fate Bounds. Garner goes into detail on Twitter, explaining that indie titles have almost no control over their own placement or promotion. Quote, Platform X gives developers no ability to manage their games. In order to get promotion, you must jump through hoops, beg and plead for any level of promotion, and a blog is not as good as they think it is. If Platform X doesn't like your game, no fanfare, no feature, and no love. In addition, uh, Garner describes frustrating levels of red tape in getting games onto the PlayStation Store, or the Platform X Store. This process involves passing certification on three different generations of backend software, creating PlayStation-specific trailers for the title, writing a PlayStation blog article, and submitting multiple forms for social media. Garner also mentioned the inability to run launch discounts on the platform are actually a common practice for indie titles on the Nintendo Switch and Xbox. It's kind of deeper than it sounds because that means when a game launches it'll run at a discount on other platforms but not PlayStation, which means that not only is it the platform with the most red tape and headaches, but also the worst deal for players when a game launches. This all sounds like a huge pain in the ass if uh, your business relies on these platforms. Yeah, on Platform X. And also, it gets worse. Garner goes on to complain about needing to coordinate with an account manager, only to not have one and not be told how to get one. The ultimate insult hit when it came to promotions. Now, most indie games are buried immediately upon release, just kind of what happens. Uh, but Garner alleges that Platform X charges a modest $25,000 for featured placement on the store, and that's in addition to the 30% take that they get of every sale already. In an interview with IGN, Garner detailed that the offer was given to him during a marketing presentation saying, quote, honestly, felt like a F2P tactic for you to play. Uh, we slow you down and you can pay to speed up. <laughs> it reminds me a lot of what Facebook would do every time they launched a new service. Anyone that posted on it would get boosted to the top so they get tons of followers, and then they'd start throttling their reach, being like, you have all these followers, but you're not reaching them. Maybe if you gave us $200, we might let you see them every once in a while. Yeah, it's skeezy as heck, but when you own the platform, you can do that kind of stuff. It's worth noting that IGN reporter Rebecca Valentine spoke with other publishers and said, quote, many hadn't heard of the $25,000 offer before. In the same article, Akupara Games CEO David Logan mentioned that paying that much for exposure on the storefront can possibly, quote, amount to the entire lifetime sales of the title as well as being, quote, greater than or equal to some of indie developers' entire marketing budgets. Believe it or not, 25K is actually the indie slash discount rate for promotion, because promotional budgets for multi-million dollar properties can get super wacky. Kotaku reported on this story, uh, and according to their verified source, uh, they said that Sony's paid promotion could go up to as high as $200,000. Regardless, Garner summarizes their beef by saying, quote, Platform X is super successful and awesome hardware, but their back end and process is straight out of the early aughts. And if the story ended there, we could probably just chalk it up to one frustrated indie dev that's mad they're not shipping the next Hotline Miami, but it didn't. In the days since, multiple indie developers have vocalized agreement with Garner's frustrations, uh, some going so far as to name Sony specifically. Whitethorn Games CEO Matthew White joined the conversation with his handy dandy pie chart regarding his company's game sales on each platform, noting that, quote, less than 3% of sales as a company are on platform X. Developer of indie hit Hypnospace Outlaw Jay Tholen blatantly stated, quote, yeah, PlayStation sucks for indie devs, end quote, revealing that 
quote, we've sold like trash on there compared to the other big consoles. Also, we make more sales on Itch alone than we do on PS, I'm pretty sure. The hit parade keeps coming. Indie publisher No More Robots head Mike Rose likewise said it without saying it by posting the quote, devs are too worried to say it publicly, but quote, trust me when I say that the vast majority of devs are reading that thread and nodding their heads violently. The consensus certainly seems to be that for indie devs, PlayStation is the most difficult platform to work with and routinely results in the lowest sales. So credit where credit's due here, PlayStation has made explicit efforts to support independent developers in the past couple of years. Back in April 2020, PlayStation head Jim Ryan announced that Sony Interactive Entertainment created a $10 million fund to support indie titles while appointing Shuhei Yoshida as head of indie initiatives in July of the same year. I mean, that's nothing to sneeze at. The $10 million is a lot, although you do kind of have to wonder how that money's getting spent, uh, whether it's directly funding any game developers or greenlighting uh, games to publish, or it's an investment in Sony hiring more reps, revamping their software systems. Who knows how that money's getting spent? It, it may be Sony is actually the beneficiary of that in as much as the indie developers are, but it's it's something. Regardless, even players in the indie scene have noticed Sony's lack of promotion when it comes to indie games. Notable review sites all rated PlayStation's latest indie exclusive, Chicory, A Colorful Tale. They all rated it very highly when it released back on June 10th. And yet, after only a few weeks, it's not featured on the PlayStation Store or the PlayStation 5 anywhere, while titles uh, that are over a year old, like Doom Eternal and Metro Exodus, are prominently placed right now. If we interpret this as cynically as possible, uh, it doesn't help Sony to sell indie games at a lower price point, since they take a 30% cut of sales. From their perspective, why not cash the tech to promote Doom Eternal when it still costs 60 bucks, uh, then they say no to that money and promote an indie game at $20, right? Because they make more money off the $60 sale than they do on the $20 sale. Oh, incidentally, and this is something interesting to note, Doom Eternal's $15 on the Steam Summer Sale right now, and it's fully playable as part of Xbox Game Pass. And Lawrence, they're still running it for $60 on the PlayStation Store? $60. Uh, now, now, for the PlayStation Store specifically right now, it may be, it's probably placed as part of a, it basically got a next-gen update. So, uh, the placement on the store directs you to the buying page on PS4, which is itself $60. So, that's, that's still a little rough, though. That game's been out for a long time. And, uh, as we referenced earlier, indie devs complained that they didn't have any control over the price of their own games. So, pretty clear Bethesda probably would have put it at a discount if they could, given that it's discounted on every other platform right now. now this isn't the first time in recent weeks that Sony has been throwing their weight around either, uh, specifically when it comes to controlling game prices. Uh, we reported on that a few weeks ago. Mm hmm Yeah, actually uh, a little under two months ago, yeah. Sony is currently the target of the class action suit that's alleging that Sony is intentionally creating a digital monopoly on their storefront to artificially inflate the prices of their digital games. And you can look at Doom Eternal to see it in action right now. Yeah, so from our perspective, and you know, we don't have access to all the info. It's, it's opaque even to the indie devs, so we're even another step removed, but from our perspective, it certainly seems like Sony's competitors are investing a lot more into the indie developer scene right now. Right, right. Uh, Xbox operates the ID at Xbox program, which helps indie developers bypass a lot of the startup costs involved with publishing on the Xbox platform. Yeah, a few features of ID at Xbox in particular uh, seemed aimed at allowing indie devs to circumvent, you know, red tape and logistics. Uh, there's the ability to convert a retail Xbox directly into a dev kit, uh, and there's also a process to publish on the Microsoft Store completely without concept approval if, quote, your game follows our standard store policies. When it comes to promotion, uh, the ID at Xbox website promises that indie games under this program, quote, are sold digitally in the Windows and the Xbox One stores alongside all other games and have access to the same discovery tools, recommendations, trending, a curated spotlight section, and more. Now, theoretically, that, that doesn't rule out paid placement on their part either, but it does, it does indicate that there is a conceivable path to placement and promotion that doesn't involve money. Uh, the, the trending, the curated spotlight sections, those could be free. That much could be seen in the 2017 indie hit Cuphead. Uh, Xbox threw a ton of promotion behind the game, which went on to release on the Nintendo Switch and PlayStation 4. To be fair there too, uh, it didn't hit the Switch until a year and a half after release and the PS4 almost three years after release. So yeah, maybe the promotion was an exchange for time platform exclusivity. Uh, even still, Chicory, the uh, platform exclusive we mentioned above, didn't receive any such promotion despite being in a very similar position. One could argue that Sony did pour a little more love on the PS5 exclusive Returnal, which was technically an indie release when it launched in April. But truthfully, a lot of people noticed this too. It didn't seem like it got that much of a push. Yeah, I was really confused by this, because uh, I'd, I'd followed Housemark for a while, really liked their games, was super amped for Returnal. And I remember even a month out, like looking through the internet for something, because I wanted to learn more about the game. 
I remember a, a preview went up on the PlayStation blog. There was a couple of minutes out of, of out of a state of play, and that was kind of it for a long time. Uh, then reviews hit normal gaming blogs a few days before release, but that's that's pretty muted for what's a, supposed to be like a big tentpole release or a system exclusive, something you're investing heavily in. Even though the promo behind Returnal seemed a little light, uh, Sony acquired Housemark this week, uh, which certainly applies the two companies were far more connected and cozy than a majority of the indie developers that are not being scouted for acquisition. If you're on the verge of acquisition and the most Sony's gonna do for you is a cu couple of blog posts and a trailer, man, I, yeah, it really kind of sets the table for what they're gonna do for you if they don't wanna buy you. We're comparing Cuphead to Returnal, that's not really apples to apples, you know, just food for thought, trying to find similar circumstances. Right, and, and, and as far as Steam concerned, I, Steam's unique, we all know that. It's been around for, you know, 20, 30 years, whatever it is at this point. It's, I think it's, about, what is it, 20 years now? And uh, they just, they have a different way of doing things. <laughs> as far as indies are, con are concerned, Steam is arguably the easiest and most approachable platform, which has created a whole other problem. There are, there are way too many games on Steam, so Valve had to invent a whole system just to manage what games appear to who and why. As part of Steam's discovery update in 2014, game placements on Steam, quote, will depend on how customers are responding to your product by purchasing, playing, reviewing, and other such factors. Yeah, and that created a whole ca cascade of follow-up conversations about review bombs and like people manipulating the system. And it, it's, cra it's crazy the derivative problems you get from trying to solve one problem. Uh, yeah, to put a fine point on it, uh, Valve flatly says, Nope, in their FAQ when asked if companies can pay for placement. Quote, you focus on making a compelling, interesting, and unique game, and Steam will work out the best places to feature your game based on customers' interests, preferences, and feedback. Interestingly, and I thought this was kind of cool, Valve does stack the deck in favor of games that have few reviews initially in the new on Steam Q list, with community engagement determining placement and featuring from that point on. Yeah, it's rather characteristic for Valve to invent a behavior-driven system in lieu of a uh, human review <laughs> and approval. So it's not surprising they've done the same when it comes to placement and promotion of indie games that a robot does it. Largely, people seem to be okay with it these days. I don't want to speak for every indie dev that has beef with Steam because it, Lord knows it's got its own problems, but yeah, it's it's settled out to, to a decent place. Uh, they just keep kind of Nixing problems as they pop up, like review bombing, they invented like review windowing to separate the bombs from the- it's crazy. So credit where credit's due, at least Valve isn't selling ad space on their stores, and they clearly have no problem letting developers run steep discounts on their games, as evidenced by that Steam sale that goes on, what is it, every six months or every three months now? I can't even keep track of all these Steam sales. Nintendo launched their Nindies program back in 2017, designed to encourage indie and third-party development on the Nintendo Switch. Uh, they since changed the branding to Nintendo Indie World. That's what it was called in Japan, so it's kind of like more global branding. Uh, and they have dedicated Nintendo Directs and uh, featured store space to highlighting indie games and sales. Uh, headlines surrounding the program's launch were practically glowing, with indies saying they were being treated like royalty. And that's a crazy about face from what people used to say about Nintendo. However, you know, time goes on. Uh, IGN's report indicates this support may have, quote, dried up in years since, once it became apparent that Switch consoles and software were selling pretty well. So what's the deal here? Is Sony greedy and behind the times, or is this just a case of a company operating their own business in their own way? Uh, I, if my, the, the easy take here, again, from the outside anecdotal take is that Sony's acting now a lot like Nintendo used to act, uh, like 10 years ago or so. Sony has great selling hardware, a powerful roster of first party developers. Uh, when you're in this position, all of your money flow is generated inside your walls you really don't see the need to reach out to people much. Uh, and it's becoming more and more clear that that is, is a Sony directive. I, I'm, I'm just, I'm watching it happen when we report on these stories. You can read evidence of this in the recent headlines about PlayStation's crossplay agreement with Epic Games for Fortnite. Uh, it's a little complicated and it's a little, a little less nefarious than it sounds, but essentially Sony requires Epic to repay any disproportionate revenue they earn on other console platforms compared to the player bases. So if they're earning more money on a different platform, but more players are on PlayStation, Epic's got to pay part of that money back. Sony has some weight. They don't mind throwing it around. It feels very, very similar to post-Wii Nintendo. They had sold record-setting amounts of Wiis. Uh, their own software was selling like crazy. They were making crazy profit margins on all of it. They were swimming in cash, stock, stock value through the roof. Presumably, they held all the leverage when it came to games production. If you wanted to be on a platform that was in, you know, 90 million homes, you had to make it for the Wii. But without third-party promotion or support, the Wii's software lineup withered on the vine. A few years in, and Nintendo couldn't sell any software except their own, and Wii's were packed up and moved into the closet. Yeah, and the Wii U didn't 
was pr was probably worse. Actually, harder to develop for, less outreach. So yeah, it, it took Nintendo a while to learn that lesson. Uh, uh, they, they had to get they had to get a couple black eyes, but learn they did uh, 2017's headlines are still to be believed when it comes to third-party support Yeah, not to mention I mean you can see the if you look in the, the switch store you can see the the difference uh, It's not Wii U anymore. There's at, at, like every week There's at least 20 games that get dumped on the switch not all of them are bangers So while the PlayStation 5 is too big to fail right now there may come a day, actually, you know what, I'm gonna say not may, there will come a day when price inflexibility, low sales, and bureaucratic waste uh, cause small to mid third parties to leave the platform. Uh, I, it's gonna happen if they continue to operate this way. Do you think it's gonna matter though, you know? Are you really gonna not buy the console that has Last of Us Part 7? See, what's, what's interesting about this is that it doesn't, it's not like, there isn't usually a turning point that we can all point to and be like, it was this one day. It's, it's a gradual change over time uh, in public opinion. And then eventually, you don't realize it, but five years down the line, all of us are like, why would we buy the PlayStation? It doesn't make any sense. All they, they only sell Last of Us Part 7. They, that's the only game they have. Uh, and, and then we'll be like, oh, shit. That's because they all of these changes over time where they, they you know, closed off their walls and now all they have is Last of Us and Uncharted. So uh, we, we, we won't notice it until we're in it. Yeah, well, I mean, when it comes to marketing and, and like brand positioning, there's, there's a nice clean image for Game Pass that sh like has a series of box arts and dates for release. And it's it's like one every other week to the end of the year, uh, and that's kind of like that's what Xbox has put all their efforts in. That one image, it's just is blah, 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 a bunch of games that are first and third party. Um, meanwhile, you think about like if you're going to buy a PlayStation now, what are you going to play? I mean, there's four or five games that pop in there, but not a lot of promise for the future aside from just the general assurance that it's a PlayStation and it's going to get sweet rad games, and that Sony keeps acquiring developers. So eventually, Last of Us Part 7 is going to come out on it, so you have to buy it. Kind of in the way that, I don't know, Metroid was probably going to come out on a Nintendo console, so you had to get that too. But yeah, we're... Uh, I feel like the fact that games are just flatly more expensive on PlayStations now, digital ones, uh, it's probably going to... People are probably going to start shifting away from it playing anything but first-party games, you know? I certainly have. Uh, anecdotally, this was the first time I saw, I think ge in general, public opinion shift around Microsoft at E3. And a lot of people were just saying, Games Pass is the best deal in gaming. Like, I don't know why you wouldn't have Game Pass. Uh, and that was the first time I'd seen everybody kind of rally around Microsoft and be like, yeah, you know what? They, they, they kind of won it. Um, and that was a that was a major deal because obviously yeah they're still going to sell PlayStations just through the roof for the next five years, but if they continue like they're doing, then it's going to be the pendulum swing right back to Microsoft, uh, just like it was before with the PS3 and the Xbox 360. So yeah, I guess I guess in four or five years time we'll see what the revenue numbers are per department, and that'll be the ultimate that'll be the ultimate tale. But what do you think? Do, are you going to buy Sony's PlayStation Five even though you can't get it because it's going to get scalped by everybody? It'll be interesting to see if. Uh, if the indie and like double A developers just start saying forget it to PlayStation entirely and then they just lose out on that that chunk of sales, we'll see. Maybe that'll force their hand. Well, you know what, uh, Lawrence, I'm not buying a PlayStation 6. I'm saying it right now. What if there's not a PlayStation 6? What if it's just a patch that you put on your eyeball? I'm not buying that either.